Greetings once again in that name that is above every name, for the Bible declares that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. Oh, bless the Lord, how wonderful it is to be here on another wonderful Lord's Day, and what a good day it is in the city of Philadelphia. It is a man like a spring day. God has blessed us with another one of his beautiful days that he shared with us. Amen. Who would not serve a God like that? And so we are just delighted to have all of those persons who are are uh, on board this evening and those who are online and those who are in person. And so let me just go ahead and say, welcome SMZ, Philadelphia and vicinity. Uh, those who are watching from across the country and around the world, amen. We are delighted that you would join us today and how blessed we are and how wonderful it is, to, amen, to be a part once again uh, God's agenda for the day. And he has blessed us, amen, to be alive, to yet be alive. What a blessing it is, and we we praise God. We praise God for all of those who have sharing with us online. Amen. Let's see who we have from us uh, sharing today. Amen. We thank God. Uh, amen. Welcome, Sister Brenda Mitchell. Welcome, Sister Teresa Poole. Welcome, Deacon Charles Parker and Sister Vicki Parker. Uh, Georgia Connection, all the way from Sylvania, Georgia. Delighted to have you on board. Welcome, Sister Laura Kennelly. Amen. Delighted to, amen, to hear from you today also. And now you are online, saying by your actions, in spite of the difficulties and, and uh, situations, your situation, you're saying by your actions, is there any word from the Lord? And there is a word from the Lord. Delighted to have you on board. Sister Sheila Adams is on board. Amen. We're delighted to have you on board. Sister Barbara Cherry is on board. Deacon Daniel Johnson is on board. Sister Vicki Lynn Colbreth is on board. Delighted to have you on board. Amen. Deacon Wilbert Moore, all the way from Newcastle, Delaware. Amen. And then we are delighted to see you and have you on board. Sister Gwendolyn McDowell, all the way from, amen, Buffalo, New York. Amen. She just go, keep going further and further north. She was in Rochester, now she's all the way in Boston. God bless you, and I hope you had a nice and wonderful warm day like we did in Philadelphia. Welcome, Sister Josephine Wright is on board. Welcome, Sister Valerie Mann is on board. Sister Dawn C. Bain is on board. Welcome, Brother June Cole is on board. Sister Mary L. Smith is on board. Sister Gail Smalls is on board. Amen. Another Georgia connection, Sister to Betty Trimble all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. Amen. I understand it was about 70 some odd degrees down there today and so I long to be there. It, it won't be long and, and uh, hopefully if it's the Lord's will that I will be in that area soon. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Welcome Sister Sharon. Our Uta is on board all the way from uh, Ardmore, Pennsylvania. Welcome Sister Peggy Haley is on board. Welcome, Brother Lamont. Dante Jackson is on board. Welcome, Sister Diane Curtis, one of our staple members. Amen. Welcome, Sister Dion Hyatt, all the way from uh, Middletown, Delaware. Amen. We're delighted to have all of those persons on board. Amen. What a blessing it is. And as we continue tonight in I study in the book of James. James is that James is that practical apostle 
Amen. He just, he just comes straight at you and make it as plain as the nose on your face and the toes on your feet. James is a very practical guy. And he says, if you've got faith and if you got good religion, amen. We used to sing a song down south. You got, I know I got good religion. Amen. Because it shows up in your conduct. And that's what, and that's what James is dealing with. Amen. That, that kind of practical Christianity. Amen. Because, uh, amen. Uh, and uh, y'all know how I like to put it. Because a lot of times, a lot of times believers and churchgoers, we spiritualize stuff. Everything ain't spiritual. Amen. We are not always spiritual. We can't be because we're still in the flesh. And I think I said on last week, we got two natures. We got a nature, an earthly nature from below that I got from my mama and my daddy that was passed on to me from Adam. But then I have a, a heavenly nature that comes from above through, uh, from God through Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. And both natures are in the same body and it's almost like cold air and hot air and that's what creates a storm. And you know why we have <clears throat> storms in our lives that we wouldn't dare let folk know that we are experiencing that? You know how some folk who've been on the battlefield for a long time, all of a sudden, ah, uh, they've been drinking Coke all of these years, and then they decided to move on to Pepsi. And when they get hooked on Pepsi, and, uh, and you can substitute Coke and Pepsi for anything you want to substitute it for, they act, they act like they ain't never had Coke before. Well, let me see if I can make it look. I mean, let me do, just do like James. You know, you used to be an alcoholic, and now all of a sudden you can't stand other alcoholics. James says, you ought to stop acting like that. Like you ain't never done that before. Amen. You, 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 see, you see some, you see uh, other folk who are caught up in uh, a, a sin and, uh, and you're probably guilty of the same sin, but you just didn't get caught. And you act like you ain't never did that before. And you come down so hard on other folk. James says, James says, you, 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 you judge folk who are made in the image of God. And he said, you really don't have that kind of authority because you're still in the flesh. Well, let me move on. We, we have come to chapter four. And chapter four is one of those exciting but yet challenging chapters. Because for three chapters, James opens up by saying, my brethren. Chapter one, he said, brethren, count it all joy when you fall in the diver's temptation. Chapter two, James says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen, with partiality. Chapter three, he says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers. But James is so frustrated and fed up with these Christians until he either does it intentionally or he forgets when he gets to chapter 4. Because when he gets to chapter 4, he does not address them as brethren because they are not acting like brothers and sisters. Did you see that? If y'all can read it for yourself, chapter 1, 2, and 3, he opens it up by saying, my brethren. But when he gets to chapter 4, he says, where do, he asks, he asks a rhetorical question. And what's the rhetorical question? Where do wars and fights come from among you? See, James is talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. 
because he is, he is the pastor of the mother church in Jerusalem. He says, do they not come from your desire for pleasure that wars in your members? Hmm. Verse 2. He said, you lust. That means you lust after something that, that you shouldn't have or you shouldn't want. You ever see a believer, you, you know, the Jews, they used to call it the blood and bruising Jews. You know, they, they didn't want to see, they didn't want to meet a woman on the street. And so if a woman was coming near to them, they would put their head into the wall not to see a woman. Yeah. The lust, he says, and you, you lust and you do not have. You murder, you covet, you covet and you design something that don't belong to you. Anybody ever desired something that didn't belong to them? I told you about this secret storm on the inside. Cold air wants to be where hot air is, and hot air wants to be where warm air is, and that's what creates a storm, and they get us out on the middle of the sea, and one gets the best of the other, and then they start picking up water, and then dumping it all on the land, because cold air wants to be where hot air is, and evil wants to be where good is, and good wants to be where evil is, because I am of a dual nature. I got two natures in me. I got an earthly nature, which is evil, and I got a heavenly nature, which is good, and that secret storm that I wouldn't dare let you know that I am designed some something that I don't, I shouldn't have. You know, not too many Christians talk like that. They see something that, that they like. Amen. They always talk about the stuff that they are not tempted about. You know, they're hard, they hard on drinking because you don't drink. Amen. But you have to be quiet when you start talking about adulteries because they didn't see you. You remember, you remember that, you remember that New Testament, you, you remember uh, over there in the Gospels, over there in the, in the, in the Gospels, where, where Jesus says, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you remember over there in the Gospels, when, the, when they caught the woman in the very act and brought her to Jesus, amen. And Jesus began to write on the ground, and, uh, and uh, I know exactly what he wrote because he was following after his father. And uh, uh, in the, in the, over there in the Old Testament, when the handwriting wrote on the wall, the handwriting said, you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And Jesus wrote on the ground and said, every one of you been weighed in the balance and y'all have found wanting. In other words, every one of y'all are guilty of something. And maybe they were guilty of adultery, cause they and, and they were and and they were evil because if she were caught in the very act, they brought the woman without bringing the man. The last time I looked, adultery is not a is is is, is not a solo, but it's a duet. And so and 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 so uh, you, you know. We are always coming at folk with the stuff that we don't do. What about lying? And what about gossiping? And what about holding grudges? You know, all that stuff, all that stuff is sin. And James, James says, you lust and do not have, you murder, and you covet, and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And, and, let, and, and before I get too far, let me just say that, that James uses another measurement of spiritual growth. James is saying, you show how spiritual you are based on you, your behavior. 
He says, there are wars you are fighting among yourselves all because of greed. Yeah, it's right there in verse 1. I didn't make this stuff up. Greed, watch this. Where do wars, and he asked that rhetorical question. This is one of those questions that uh, a city of hall says you just got to go, hmm. Uh, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do not, uh, they do not come, do not they come from your desires for pleasure and war in your members? For pleasure. You, 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 you know what the, what the theme of the old Playboy magazine was? That play, pleasure, Deacon Simpson, is the ultimate end. And, uh, and we bought into that kind of philosophy where eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow you'll be dead. We bought into that kind of philosophy. Take care, number one. Who told you you were number one? If you're number one, then who's God? And so take care of myself. All I want to do is make sure that I pleasure myself. That is not the chief end of man. If you want to know what the chief end of man is, did I give you Psalm 125, uh, Deacon Simpson, verses 1 and 2? Watch this. Psalm 145. I'm glad you're on it. He says, I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will, this is the chief end of man, every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. And if that's not good enough, let's go to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 and verse 13 and 14. The wise man, King Solomon, said, "Let I've tried." He says, "I done tried everything under the sun. I done tried liquor. I had vineyards. I done tried ladies. I had more women than everybody else. I had 300 wives and 700 concubines. I done tried luxuries, and uh, I had all kinds of gardens." and read all kinds of books. He said, but listen, he said, I spent my whole life only to discover, watch this, that the chief end of man was, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He said that the chief end of man is to glorify God, fear God, and keep his commandment, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work un into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He said, this is the chief end of man. Hmm. And, uh, and James used three simple things to help us to discover our spiritual growth. First one, he says, and since he used the rhetorical questions, you don't have to answer these questions, but you can just answer them. You, ju you can just answer them to yourself. He said the first one is greed. You know whether you are greed or not. You know whether you always want to pleasure yourself. You know whether you want to. Uh, you are always desiring uh, putting yourself up and design, coveting, design stuff that don't belong to you. He said, that's what causes fights and jealousy because you're jealous of that person because they can sing better than you. You're jealous of them because they can preach better than you. you can, you're, you're, you're jealous of them because they are more articulate than you are. You, you're jealous of them because they got one of those bubbly kind of personalities and you got laid back personality and everybody everybody gravitate to them. And you, and you want to be like that. You see them walk in, the room, walk in a room and the room light up. And you, and you want that kind of glory. James says, don't you know why all of these fights uh, 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 happen in the church? Because they comes from your desire for pleasure and your lust. You lust 
and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You can't get what other folk get, get so you get upset with them. And uh, you, you might not be so bold as to murder a person with a knife or a gun or a poison, but you will murder a person, you will kill their character with your mouth. And James talked about that in, the ch in chapter 3 when he talked about the use of the tongue. Because sometimes we talk too much. You like 3, 6, and 10. You want to be the first one to get the news out. Don't forget that you heard it from here first. And I told you, I told you sometimes they throw it out there and know they don't have the complete story because they know that they throw it out there, somebody's going to call them up and get it and, and get it right. And you know how, you, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, you know, I'll quote a, a secular phrase or a secular song and, uh, and, and sometimes I'll get it mixed up and somebody will call me and give me the right words. And I'm like, that wasn't my point. <laughs> All right. And, and, and James, 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 he said, you fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And then when you do ask, watch this. Verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. You are asking out of order. You have the wrong motive. I want to sing like Deacon Haskins so I can be the lead singer and so folk can cheer me on. I'm asking for the wrong reason. And he says, we, sometimes we ask, watch this, watch this. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that ye may spend it on your pleasure. And whenever you see that word just keep popping up, you know, pleasure, you, you know, and that's one of the, thing, one of the things that, that is the fruit of the flesh. The fruit of the flesh wants to pleasure itself. You're only thinking about you. You are selfish. And so, and so G, uh, J James says that uh, you, can, you can tell whether a person is growing spiritual uh, by their greed. They're greedy. That's what we used to call them down south. And we only put, we only apply greedy, we only apply greedy into eating, but you can be greedy in a whole lot of things. It does not just goes on, on, on uh, uh, eating, but you can be greedy. The Bible talks about greedy for filthy lucre. He said you ought not put a man in position and make a guy a deacon or an official in the church if he's greedy for filthy, filthy lucre. Because you hear what the text says, he spent it for his own pleasure. Amen. And, and it was not only, not only greed, but grief. James, as the pastor of the Jerusalem church, this brother was grieved and he was hurt because there was not a whole lot of spiritual growth in the church. They were manifesting uh, the fruits of the flesh and not of the spirit. That grieves a pastor when, when folk have been around for a long time and there is no spiritual growth and there's still quarrels and still fighting and still manifesting the fruit of the flesh rather than the fruit of the spirit that grieved the pastor. He said, you have not because you have asked, and when you do ask, you ask because your motives are wrong. Verse 4, he said, you sinners, 
Well, he just called it, you, you know, James doesn't, James doesn't know how to cover it up. And I guess that's where I got that from. James, he just says, you adulterous and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? I think I'm going to stay there for a minute. He said, do you not know, watch this, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God, and whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What you saying, Pastor? I'm saying you can be a believer and a so-called Christian and you are an enemy of God. You, 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 you know, back in chapter 2, it says, back in chapter 2 and verse 23, if, 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 uh, if uh, Deacon Simpson could get that for me, watch this. He said, the scripture was fulfilled, which says that Abraham believed the God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. God is always looking for a friend because a friend, you can just be yourself. See, when you are a friend of God, you can talk to God about anything. You don't, you don't have to put no God up. You can come to God naked with no pretense and just lay it all out. And then guess what? You ain't got to worry about God telling nobody. Abraham was called a friend of God because he was obedient to God and he believed God and it was counted unto him righteousness and he was called a friend of God. And I stopped by to ask you tonight a rhetorical question. Are you a friend of God? And you don't have to answer that. That's a rhetorical question, too. And you, you can ponder that question. He says, if you are a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God, and whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Hmm. Good God Almighty. Yeah. An enemy of God. If you are a fr if your bosom buddy is a worldly person and you can't get them to change, you may have to depart from those folks. Y'all ain't gonna like me. There have been some folk in my life that I was close to, and I was trying to help them by my lifestyle, and either I'm gonna change them or they were gonna change me. And so I've had to cut some folk loose because they were too carnal and too worldly-minded. This ain't popular. This ain't popular, but if you, you are so closely connected with somebody with the, with the world and you hang with those more than you hang with God's people, it may be that you are an enemy of God. I ain't making this stuff up. It's right here in your Bible. It says adulteresses and adulteress, and really, really, in, in the Message Bible, it says sinners, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? When you show so connected to worldly folk, and I've heard folk boast about that I got friends in the world treat me better than friends in the church. My drinking buddies, and yet you hanging with them. 
And yet, watch this. Now, I'm going I'm, I'm, you know, to walk down somebody's aisle. And sometimes we embrace disobedient folk in the church. You know they are disobedient. And you know they're in transgression, and they make no bones about it. They'll curse you out in the church and then leave and come back, and you'll embrace them. You'll embrace them in your bosom, and you know what they did was wrong. God is looking for a friend. You know how little kids are growing up when they be looking for a friend, and they said, you'll be my friend, will you be my friend? They even they got sense enough to know that when you, when you discipline them, they say, you ain't my friend. And sometimes when God disciplined them, folk are like, you ain't my friend. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. He says, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world or worldly-minded thinking people makes himself an enemy of God. It's right here on the screen. It's, 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 it's in your Bible if you didn't tear it out. He said, you sinners, do you not know that, that friendship with the world or let me just go ahead and put it in there and worldly-minded people is enmity against God and whosoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world cannot be a friend of God. You want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy with God. Once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and this kind of stuff, it grieved. <clears throat> it grieved the pastor to see folk embracing worldly-minded stuff and still trying to be a part of the church. That kind of stuff grieves a pastor or do you think verse 5 or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearned jealousy hmm Dean Simpson did you get me uh, Proverbs uh no, I think I want, I think I want Ephesians 4.30. Do you not know, do you not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption? Every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he gives them the Holy Spirit to seal them until the day of redemption. One, he, once you receive the Spirit, you, he permanently dwells with you. Hmm. You know, a, you know the Holy Spirit is with you with, with your foul mouth? Do you know that? Do we, you, know, you know when you, you, you make, the, make up this story that I'm going into, the reason I was going into the bar, I was going in there to do some witnessing. You know the Holy Spirit was with you. And Paul makes it a little bit plainer when he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit because he is a person, he has feelings, and he has emotion. And when, when you misbehave as a believer, the Holy Spirit is sitting there crying, saying, oh, no, please don't go down that street again. Oh, please don't go down. You grieve the Holy Spirit because he's there with you. It, it says that the Holy Spirit has sealed you until the day of redemption. And you know where I'm from. I'm from the country, and we used to put up uh, preserve, and we used to put it in the jars. And, uh, and whenever we would put the preserve in the jars, the pears or the peaches or whatever, we used pint jars or quart jars, and uh, we would take it out of the hot pot and put it in the glass, and, uh, and then we'd sit it in a pot of cool water, 
and put, and put that lid with the, you know, uh, that mason jar, that lid with the rubber around it, and when, you, and when you put that lid on top of it and you don't tighten it real tight, you just kind of tighten it loosely, and as the hot stuff cools down, it sucks all of the air out of the jar and that rubber seals it and now you can tighten it and if you did it in July, it's, it'll be good next July. In other words, Deacon Simpson, it's sealed until you get ready to redeem it. And what God is saying, that, that you are sealed by the Holy Ghost until I get ready to come back for you. And so wherever you take Wherever you go, you take the Holy Ghost with you. Whatever you say, the Holy Ghost is right there with you. Whatever you put into your body, whether it's cigarettes with labels on them or cigarettes with no labels on them, all of that stuff, and the Holy Spirit is there. And, and Paul said, you ought not grieve the Holy Spirit of God because he has sealed you to the day of redemption. No wonder this pastor James, the brother of Jesus, the bishop of the Jerusalem church, no wonder he was grieved because of their yeah. No wonder he was grieved because of their grief, because of their greed. And so, so he reveals, James in verse 1 and 2, he reveals the cause of the conflict. And the cause of the conflict is because of your own pleasure. And then he gives us the consequences in verse 4 of uh, uh, uh of the conflict. He said the consequences of non-spiritual growth is that you become an enemy of God. And who wants to fight against God? Because if you fight, you know, I used to hear my daddy said, but I translated what he said. He said, you can't fight old, because if you fight old, you're going to lose. I stopped by to tell somebody today, you can't fight against God because if you fight God, you're going to lose. You know what God did? He painted the sky blue without a ladder, ladder or a step uh, or a paintbrush. You know what he did? He put heat in the sun to warm us during the summer. And guess what? Ain't nobody ever tried to go to the sun. <laughs> yeah, he put the twinkle in the stars. He put green in grass and, and white in milk from a black cow. God did it just by speaking a word. You, you don't want to fight against God. You're going to lose. And if you are a believer, if you are a believer and you are a friend to the world, you are an enemy against God. Read it for yourself. I didn't make that stuff up. It's in your Bible. Jane Johnson, it's good to see you. It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible if you didn't tear it out. But good, good, you know what I like about God is that he always proposes a cure. So we, we not only get the conflict and we not only get the consequences, but great good God of mine. That's enough you make you shout right there. Somebody, somebody should have put it, somebody should have put it in the chat. They should have put it in there. Shout. Because God always, I don't care how bad a situation gets and how rough it is and where you are, God always offers a cure. Good God Almighty, I like that. Hey, Amen. You know, I'm, you know, I, I just get happy myself. Because <laughs> I can't see y'all. I guess y'all getting happy too. But I'm, I'm just getting happy because as messed up as I am and as wretched as I am, 
God's got a cure. I like that. Not only does he reveal the cause of the conflict and the consequences of the conflict, but he, he, God gives us the cure to the conflict. And what's the cure? I'm glad you asked. It's right there in verse 5. Yeah. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. It yearns, the, the spirit is just waiting for you to come back. The spirit is just, he's just waiting for you to do right. And because you know the Old Testament said that, and God is a jealous God. And they went a whoring after strange gods, and, and, and it made God jealous. But let's, let's go to, I, I really wanted to, verse 6. Let's go to the next one. But he, uh, uh, but, 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 oh, yeah, that's, this is it. This is it. This is it. Yeah. Good God Almighty. But he gives more grace. Good God Almighty. Therefore, he says, resist the proud. Resist the proud and arrogance. He said, resist the pride and arrogance, but he gives grace to the humble. In other words, let me just, let me just put it, in, let me just put it, put it in, in layman's turn for you. God gives you grace to withstand the proud. He gives you grace to uh, withstand worldly-minded folk because we cave into the pressure, whether it's a friend or whether it's a family, we will cave in and we will make excuses like blood is thicker than water. I don't know who tell you that. That ain't biblical. But God gives grace. And see, that, 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 that's... There's several levels of grace. You know, there's common grace. You know, everybody get that common grace, like rain and snow and, and uh, sunshine and, and night, food and clothes. Those are common graces. But since James is talking to a believer, he's talking about covenant grace. Covenant grace. In other words, you are, in, you are in relationship with God, and so because I am in relationship with God, it makes no difference where I am right now. I'm in covenant with God. I've been saved by Jesus Christ, and so in the final analyses, I've got to get up and still become a butterfly. You know how I like to put it. When a butterfly goes in a cocoon and then dies to a cocoon and emerges as a butterfly, even if he butterfly lit down on the ground where he used to crawl as a caterpillar in the final analysis, he can never go back to being a cocoon. He's going to be a butterfly. Hmm, that's enough to shout there. That's called covenant grace. Even if I mess up, I can get up. Because all things, watch this, God will use my messing up to advance my spiritual growth. Because he says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are the call according to his purpose. You know, I got this sermon, I got this call, I, I got this call, sermon that's called The Blessings of Affliction from the Old Testament from Joseph. Uh, Joseph was blessed in spite of his affliction. And he said, God, you know, God has been so good to me. He's given me so much covenant grace until I don't have time to, fo figure out, to focus on negative folk and to focus on what folk have done for me. And you know what Joseph said? What you did for evil, God meant it for good. Because the blessings of God outweighs the burdens from God. And sometimes God allows us to go through burdens and go through ups and downs in order to get our attention. And, but he gives, that's verse 6. Oh, man, that's my verse. 
but he gives grace. And you know grace, you know what grace is? The grace is the favor and the unmerited, unmerited favor of God. He gives grace, therefore, he says, resist the proud. He, he, in, in other words, it, it, you know, it, uh, if I was reading it, I'll read, I, I read it backwards and say, God, God allows us to resist the proud, but gives grace to those who are humble. He gives us grace to withstand. We don't have to agree with folk and when they know they're wrong, and we don't have to try to walk down the middle of the aisle so we don't offend nobody. Because guess what? He's given me grace. He's given me grace. I can make my own decision. I ain't got to look behind me and see who is, who is on my side and who is following me. I can make my own decision because he, God gives me grace to withstand the proud and the arrogance. Yeah. Therefore, watch this. And this is part of the solution. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, watch this negative positive, because you can't get light to shine without a negative or a positive. You ever tried to put the battery in the flashlight and you got them mixed up? You got a positive at a positive and a negative at a negative, and you wondering why this light won't shine, and then you discover when you open it up, you discover that you put the batteries in backwards. It takes a negative and a positive. When I submit to God at the same time, I've got to resist the devil. Because it takes both a negative and a positive because salvation doesn't work if I just, just dwell on what I don't do. But my salvation is also a positive. When I stop doing wrong, I got to start doing something else. I got to start doing right. Watch this. Watch this. He says, he says, if you are going to receive God's covenant grace. Therefore, he says, submit unto God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And let me add on to that for a season. Because it's not a one-time thing. Sanctification is not a one-time thing. Because once you go to this level, you're going to be tested by the devil all over again. And that's what throws us a lot of time. We, and we, we quote the scripture, D. We quote the scripture. The Bible said, resist the devil and he'll flee from me. Yeah, right. He'll flee from me for right now. But after a while, when you forgot about him and you're operating on another level and you think you got it made, then the devil throws you a curveball and you strike out again. But thank God, not only for common grace and not only for covenant grace, but for continued grace. Good God of my, I think, I think I said something. Continuous grace. God continually gives me grace because I not only need that grace today, but I need it on tomorrow. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Good God Almighty. He said, he said, he said, resist, submit unto God. You got to submit unto God and at the same time resist the devil. See, we try to submit to God and then play the middle of the road. We try to submit to God, but I don't want to offend you, and I know you're wrong because you're my friend. I don't want no friend who can't check me when I step out of line. And they don't have no friend in me who can't check them either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, moving on. And resist the devil, he will, and, and then you do what? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And then, 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 then you got to do, do three things. He says, you got to be, com you got to commit to God. You got to clean your hands, and then you got to be remorseful. You got to be godly sorrowful for what you did. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. 
He doesn't call them in chapter 4. He doesn't call them brethren. You sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. You are trying to love the world and love God at the same time. James says you are, you are, you are double-minded. And a double-minded man is an unstable-minded man. He's in sta unstable in all of his ways. Watch this. He says that there has to be some contrition. In other words, that you've got to be godly sorrowful, verse 9, watch this, godly sorrowful, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. You can't go around messing up and, 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 and uh, uh, you, you, you know, uh, if you, you can't be like the guy who was trying to prove that there was a God. And he said, if there's a God, come down and kill me right now. And he was just walking around looking up the sun, and nothing happened to him. And then afterward, a gnat flew in his mouth and choked him to death. Yeah. He was boasting about uh, there is no God because he didn't see that he didn't do nothing to me. He says, he said, you got to be remorseful for what you've done. Verse 10, he said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And the key to being lifted up, the key to being exalted is humility. And uh, you know how I like to put that? I, use it, I like to use it in a paradoxical way. If you want to go up, go down first. He said, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted and uh, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up. Verse 11, do not evil, do not speak evil of any other brethren. Now he's going back to brethren now that now that he told you how to repent and get back to God, he who speaks evil of his brother and judge his brother speaks evil of the law and judge the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And you don't qualify to be a judge. See, See, in, in the beginning of the chapter, God shows us how to turn hatred into, hatred into humility. And, and, and then he shows us uh, how to turn, our, now he shows us how to turn our boasting into belief. Therefore, is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy? Who are you to judge another? You don't qualify to judge nobody. You know why you don't qualify? You don't qualify because you don't know the whole story. You don't know the beginning from the end. You don't know how long I stood up before I fell down. And you don't know how long I was down before I got up. And you'd be saying, oh, you, look, how, look how bad he is. Look how, look how I, you, man, if I was him, I wouldn't do that. You may do worse because you don't know the whole story. You don't know the beginning from the end. And there ain't but one judge that knows the beginning from the end. And you know what his name is? He is the Alpha and the Omega. In other words, he is the beginning from the end. Jesus knows the whole story. You don't qualify to be a judge because you don't know the whole story. You know, I tell my staff and folk in leadership all the time, I said, if you see something strange before you act on it, 
talk to me because I may know the whole story. I may know more about the individual than you know, and I may know why they are acting like they act. So we can't, we, can't, we can't be judges because we don't know the whole story. In order to be an adequate judge, you have to know the beginning from the end. And since Jesus is the omniscient one, the all-knowing and the all-powerful and the everywhere present one at the same time, he knows the beginning from the end. Come now, verse 13. Come now, uh, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Verse 14, whereas, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, and, 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 and this, is a, this is a verse that the old folk used to always use, it was a long time before I knew this verse was in the Bible. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, we shall live and do this or that. Every time they would say, you know, the old folk, when they would come to see each other, when they got ready to, to depart, they would say, I'll see you tomorrow. And then they'll say, if it's the Lord's will. Deacon Simpson, did I ever tell you this story? about uh, I, I, the story uh, um, about, the, about the man who had, he had, a, he had a good job and he just got off from work and he had a pocket full of money. He had just left out of the bank. These were back in the days where you, you didn't have the uh, 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 direct deposit, but he was a construction worker and uh, he made big money and he had to walk past the church to get home. And, and when he walked past the church, uh, the, the preacher just happened to be standing on the outside. And he was a neighborhood guy. He said, uh, Bro Joe, why, uh, where, you, where you going? Uh, where you going now? Where you going today? He said, Pastor, I ain't going to, you know, I'm, I'm not going to sham you. I'm not going to tell no lie. I, I just left the bank and uh, I just got paid and, uh, and I'm going to the liquor store and I ain't bothering nobody, and I'm going home, and uh, I'm going to uh, drink my liquor, and then I'll sober up on Monday morning, and I'll be ready to go to work. And, uh, and the pastor said, well, maybe, Joe, maybe you should say it's the Lord's will. He said, the Lord ain't got nothing to do with this. He said, I made this money, and, and uh, I'm going to do what I want to do. And some thugs heard him talking to the preacher, and when he went around the, went around the corner, the thugs jumped on him, beat him up, and they was trying to get his money. They ripped his pants halfway off to get his money out, and, uh, and uh, they had to hit him upside the head a couple times, and, and he was all bruised and bloody and raggedy. And when he came back past the church, and uh, he was walking slow with his head hanging down, and Pastor said, Joe, where you going now? And Joe said, I'm going home if it's the Lord's will. Maybe you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, you're going to do this and do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And then we, since Curtis, we, we close out. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is sin. If you know what to do and you fail to do good, if you know good and don't do good, that's evil. That's sin. 
Amen. That's all I got for you tonight. I'm going to pray out, pray us out, and we're going home if it's the Lord's will. God, we thank you for another opportunity. We thank you for this privilege. We ask you for your blessings now, and we pray that the, that the seed of the gospel had fallen upon good soil and that it would penetrate the depths of our heart, and we would not only be doers of this word, but we would be hearers also, and then we would apply the preached word or the taught word to our daily lives and then seek to live thereby. In the masterful and in the marvelous name of Jesus, amen and amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. And go home if it's the Lord's will.